and oh. system improvement. And we'll talk about all that. Yeah. Uh, but making things better, uh, grabbing a hold of things, manipulating them to be better, and then turning them loose, right? Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you are ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Unhappy people's lives are out of control because they spend their days coping with the random bad results of their unmanaged systems. Happy people's lives are in control because of the good results of their managed systems. Whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, your personal systems are the threads in the fabric of your existence. So says my guest today, Sam Carpenter, author of Work the System, The Simple Mechanics of Making More and Working Less, which is now in its fourth edition. And he's also written a book called The Systems Mindset, Managing the Machinery of Your Life. Sam has extensive experience in a variety of fields, including engineering, journalism, publishing, surveying, forestry, construction management, telecommunications, and a myriad of other blue and white collar enterprises and jobs. He is an author and entrepreneur. He founded a company called Centratel, which is the premier telephone answering service in the United States, which he has owned and operated for nearly 40 years in his experience rescuing this business and then propelling it to be the number one ranked answering service in the United States comprises the thread of his best-selling book and the system that he expounds in it, which would be no surprise given that it's called Work the System. This is a book that I quite enjoyed. I took a lot away from. It's very practical, especially if you are an entrepreneur or you are a leader, someone who deals with recurring systems and processes, which we all do. If you're responsible for those, if you want to make your life a little easier, if you want to free yourself up, reduce your stress level, earn more money, have more free time, that kind of thing. This is a book you might be interested to check out. You can learn more about Sam and his work at workthesystem.com. With that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my friend, Sam Carpenter. Sam, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you, brilliant. <laughs> glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Sam, will you tell me, please, what is life about? <laughs> what is life about? Well, it depends on what angle you want to take, but I think, I think for our purposes, what I would say here is that life is about improving things, not in a virtue signaling kind of a way, but uh, I, I get the most personal satisfaction uh, out of making things better, whether it's here in the house where I am now or out there. And with my book, of course, my aim is to help business people and, and people who aren't in business to make their lives better. I just I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. And so what I would say, you could go back into genetics, I suppose, and uh, the caveman thing. And, and uh, to survive, you have to make things better. You have to prepare. You have to take care of things. And I, I think in some form or, or another, uh, the best satisfaction out of life and therefore maybe the purpose of life, at least speaking for myself, would be to make things better. Mm -hmm. All the time. And oh. system improvement. And we'll talk about all that. Yeah. Uh, but making things better, uh, grabbing a hold of things, manipulating them to be better, and then turning them loose, right? Beautiful. Yeah. Well, with that, um, you know, just starting with life, some of life's bigger questions, like this one of what's life about, I want to move to one of the, one of the other big life questions, which is about the toilet paper roll. Which <laughs> way should it hang <laughs> and why? You know, we, you want to jump into that right away. Let's see if I can uh, let's see if I can describe it in a way that'll fit into our later conversation when we get a little deeper into things. <laughs> uh, so our lives are made up of systems, and we'll talk about that more. But I'll just say that now: all our lives, where we are right now, where you are there in Utah, where I am in Kentucky, in this moment, because everything moves across time. Uh, we're here because of the processes that unfolded before this exact moment in time, right? And right. you and I worked with Steve, the engineer, on getting the sound right and, and getting the audio the way we want it. And I got my dogs under control here. Uh, so 
what that is, is if you understand that, and we'll go into it deeper later, I'm expecting, uh, you understand that you try, if you try to make system improvements in every portion of your life, your life will get better. Because most people are not managing the processes of their lives. And so their results are unmanaged results. On the one side, at the least, they're random results, which is not really what people want. No matter what you're talking about in your life, you don't want random results. Uh, and the worst thing it can can be is a nightmare. Your life's a nightmare because everything's out of control. So this is all about defeating chaos. The toilet paper uh, story is one of my favorite stories. I have to admit it and for our for our viewers, our listeners. Uh, what it is is your toilet paper on your roll in the bathroom, you're sitting there and uh, you go to peel the paper off. And uh, it's better. There's two exceptions, but it's better if it comes off the top of the roll. Okay. Uh, it's just handier. You don't have to reach under the roll to find it. And the exception are cats and kids who like to, <laughs> so that in that case, you want it coming off the bottom. The point is this, it sounds crazy, but it, in its in its uh, kind of st almost stupid uh, illustration, it says that everything you, sh in my opinion, everything you should do should be deliberate. So what wow. do you do over and over again? Well, that's one of the things all of us have done over and over again. Yep. And uh, unless you unless you live in certain, you know, in Pakistan or someplace, but if you will uh, take that little thing, it takes such a little bit of attention and put it on with the, the roll coming off the top, it'll make your life just a tiny bit better. Of course, yeah. it, it doesn't add up to anything really, but the point is you take everything in your life, everything is a system, remember? Everything in your life, you improve it, improve it. You're intentional about it, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that, that was a perfect illustration of taking a system that you didn't even notice and make it better. And I think I say at the end of the and I left this in in the fourth edition at the end of this page long description illustration. I said, now that you've read this, I'm going to kind of scare you every time you sit down on the pot. <laughs> and uh, or every time you put the roll in the in the in the in the dispenser, you will think of this. Yeah. And, and I, so what do we do routine over and over and over? Well, that's one of the things you do. And so every time I, you know, use a bathroom and, and I speak to groups about this, every time you use the bathroom, it's kind of a reminder to think about your systems. Yeah, it's crazy, but it's fun. Yeah, that's right. And it's one yeah. thing that I really do appreciate about what you teach and um for those listening who didn't see the book that Sam held up, it's the work, the system, the simple mechanics of making more and working less, which is what pretty much I think all of us want. We want to enjoy life more. We want to get more for the effort we expend. And the view that you, that you expound in this, and I love the way you word it, whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, your personal systems are the threads in the, the fabric of your existence. Yeah. Right. And it makes sense that if our life isn't what we want it to be, if our life isn't working how we want it to, if we look at those systems, what are the things that are happening or not happening? And to either dissolve the ones that are happening that are not contributing yeah. to our health and happiness and wealth and well being, yeah. or to implement or refine the ones that are. And it, it makes sense conceptually. But you talk about this from a deeply personal place. Because I understand you've now owned a telephone answering service for nearly 40 years. Yeah. But you worked inside that business for a decade and a half, yeah. working 80 to 100 hour weeks, not getting the results that you wanted. But one day, everything changed for you. Like in one day, this is almost as I read it, like, uh, I don't know, the road to Damascus moment, like this, this insight almost, uh, I don't know that you would describe it this way, but some form of enlightenment, <laughs> something happened. Will you, will you talk about the challenge that you had and how, like the day everything changed? Sure. And uh, of course, I encourage our people watching, you know, you get the first four chapters of the book for free if you go to workthesystem.com. Okay, you can download it, but get the book, get the audio. I did the audio. Uh, 
But what happened was, and I'll take the story is very carefully illustrated in the first four chapters of the book. And the front matter of the book has a lot of stuff in it. Sometimes I tell people, just read the front matter and then see if you want to read the rest. But if you go from chapter one through chapter four, I think there's 21 chapters now. Uh, what happened was I worked 80 to 100 or even more than 100 hours a week for 15 years. And right at the end of that 15 years, it was really bad. My kids were off to college. I had been a single parent uh, and I was physically and mentally destroyed and I was going to miss a payroll. And I'd had the business for 15 years. This is the same business I have today. And how old uh, were you at this time? You were like in your 30s, 40s? I was uh, 1999. So I was late 40s. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm an old guy now. Uh, so Experienced. Seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was that I realized I was going to miss a payroll. I had about, I don't know, 12 or 15 people. And when you miss a payroll in a small business, that's the end of your business because your people don't come back to work when they don't get paid. So I knew after 15 years of just intense struggle, oh man, I went through a lot of people. I went through a lot of ideas. I had so many failures. I had some successes. Somehow 15 years, the business survived. And you know, any new business, uh, eight, out of every hundred new businesses that start in five years, 80 of them are gone. Okay, that's the way it is. Four out of five fail. I had made it 15 years, which is like 1%. And I was so proud, but I wasn't gonna make it. So I had had this horrible uh, physical and mental assault. And so that one night I laid down in bed trying to, and I think I use the term, uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat uh, yet again. And I couldn't, I couldn't. So I gave up. It's three in the morning, dark at night. I couldn't sleep. I was a mental, physical wreck. And I just let it go, brilliant. I just let it go. And then all of a sudden, uh, I had an image of a table. I don't know if I was dreaming or whether I was just in this somnambulant, you know, kind of a coma, but I could see my business and I saw that it was made up of parts. And I don't know what these objects were. So I'm, I'm at a desk here with my laptop, of course, but there's a book here and there's a, there's a, I love hounds, a little hound statue. <laughs> and uh, there's a picture here and there's a bottle of water. And I realized my business, it was all laid out on a table. They were not identified parts, but I realized my business was a summary of independent parts, independent, yeah, systems, independent elements. And then I thought, well, I'm going to lose a business anyway uh, in a week was the payroll. I'm going to go down to the office in the morning and give this insight. And I didn't know. I know that one night I thought if I could improve those parts one by one, I would save my business. If I could make those parts really, really good one by one, like coming at me on a conveyor belt, I could take this one and fix it. I could take the next one and fix it that I would have, if I could make all the parts perfect, would I have a perfect business? And I didn't know the answer to that at the time, but I can tell you the truth is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and we can talk about it later, but 98% perfect is just great. You don't have to be 100% perfect. That, that can be a bad thing. But anyway, what happened was that night I had a change in insight and I realized it wasn't just the business, but my whole world was a collection of processes and systems. And here I was lying in bed as a result of the good and the bad processes that led me up to that place. And it's never been the same since. And that was in 1999. And so I've taken the same business uh, and it is the premier, there's about 800 answering services. It, they're very high tech now compared to what they used to be. And it has a long history, my industry. has. We take calls from doctors and veterinarians and software companies and pass those message on, messages on. We call capture and we pass on messages, just like an old, an old time answering service used to do. And 911. Uh, we are right. the premier in the United States. And the reason is, is because we, we work on systems all day long and that's all we do. Mm -hmm. We never, my management staff doesn't do the work. 
we have other people to do that. And those people have a chance to climb a ladder to up into management. But all we do is work on systems, whether it's our team in Europe or the team in Bend, or we have people scattered all over the United States who handle the calls. Uh, the idea is to work on the processes and then the actual work is automated, delegated uh, to other people or to systems. And if you work on improving your processes, and I'm talking about your personal life too, of course, brilliant. Yeah. Because yeah, remember, yeah. Uh, our personal lives and our business lives are, are all the same. They're made up of the results of the systems in our lives. Uh, if you work on systems all day long, it's really, uh, you're really going to improve your life. There's a lot of system gurus out there, Brilliant. Uh, I wrote the book 14 years ago. It's in its fourth edition. Just came out last year. Uh, most of the systems gurus say you have to insert systems in your business. You've got to do systems. I went to federal court with a guy who plagiarized my book, and he really didn't get it. He got the court. <laughs> I won the, <laughs> I was a, you know, petitioner, and I won the court case, and he paid some big money. Uh, but I had a process of protecting my copyright, mm. which had been perfected. And so if most of the system people out there who profess to be system people don't really get the metaphysical part of this, it's not, metaphysical isn't even fair. It's the physical reality that where we are in this moment and moments move on this moment, this moment, this moment where you and I are brilliant right now and where the listener is right now. That's a one-time event, but then in another second, there's another one-time event, and yeah. they're all made up of processes. And and when I my second book was called The Systems Mindset, and you uh, you've read enough to understand that I want my readers to get in their head this thing I call the systems mindset, and that's where you see everything all at once as a collection of separate independent processes. And I, I even say, uh, you know, this all came to me that night. Your kid, what has your kidney got to do with your lungs and got to do with your heart? Actually, nothing. That's why you have specialists. And I like to say, if you fall off a bicycle, you're not going to be you're not going to be taken to the dermatologist. <laughs> right. You're going to be taken to a specialist who knows how to fix bones that are broken. Right. Uh, and so the point is you isolate the processes in your life. And when you can see them moment to moment, like I can see all the different systems in this room. Uh, and I, it's been that way since 1999, where, wherever I am driving in the car or whatever, I see separate systems, even separate trees out my window here. You can see the dysfunctional ones. You can yeah. see the ones holding you back. It might be a horrible relationship with somebody that has been dragging you down for a long time. And until you can isolate that from all the other things going on in your life, isolate that relationship. When you can isolate that, re that relationship and see what it's doing, it's sayonara right now. No hmm. excuses, no explanations. Goodbye, man. You're out of my life. Uh, and in, in processes within business. Uh, oh, one thing uh, I did. Here's a good illustration, Brilliant, if I can go on one more point sure. here. So we had files in our office way back in 1999 of every transaction we had with every client. I think we had five or 600 clients then. We have about 1,400 now. But uh, we had uh, file cabinet after file cabinet, but every transaction. You know why? Just in case somebody questioned what we did uh, two years ago on, on February 13th at 10 a.m., you know, and uh, it just seemed tedious to me. And as I had this new systems mindset, very raw systems mindset, of course, I've developed it, uh, you know, since then. But uh, one day we had a staff meeting. I think I had two managers at the time. I said, have e either one of you ever gone into those file cabinets? So these people have been with me for quite a while. OK, mm -hmm. and we've been doing this for years. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to keep the records. We got to keep the records. Uh, have either one of you gone into our files to, to retrieve something to protect us that we did what we were supposed to do at the answering service? And they said, no. And I said, well, have either of you ever gone into it? <laughs> They've been with me like eight years, eight years and six years, I think. And they both said, no, I never have. 
And so my system's mindset response to that was clean them out now, throw it all in the trash. And they were aghast that I would do a thing like that. You have to keep them. And I said, why do we have to keep them? I, I'm about to lose a business. I don't give a rat's butt about those records. And they're just in the way. They're taking up space, uh, mental space as much as anything. And so when you get the systems mindset and you isolate your system, that was a that was a useless system. And, you know, my mantra, automate, delegate, delete, delete being the most favorite one. Yeah. <laughs> Empty the cabinets and, and we'll uh, make a make a ceremony out of it. Yeah. And we threw I mean, hundreds of pounds of little slips of paper, big slips of paper, typed up stuff all went in the trash, never to be seen again. And we've never missed it even once. You no, know, we never regretted that we did that. Yeah. So having the systems mindset allows you to separate the problem processes out of the constructive processes. And then you, as you mentioned before, brilliant. Uh, yeah. Get rid of some of the processes, but add some of the process, some new processes you don't have before. It's a real different way of looking at things. And I call it one layer deeper. It really is a one layer deeper way of looking at your life. And it's a more accurate representation of how life works. It really is. But you have to have the systems mindset. You have to get it. And hopefully by chapter four, a lot of people will get it. Some people take a long, long time to get it. Yeah, I, I think Sorry, that was a long explanation, but no, there's, it's, it's there's great. Your toilet paper thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for, for sharing that. And yeah. this, this idea of the systems mindset or one layer deeper, you use a term that I appreciate because I think it helps really uh, illustrate the, a, a way of accessing that, right? Cause it's easy to say, well, just look at things differently or be different or do things different or whatever. But this idea that you, you talk about, outside and slightly elevated. Yeah. Will you describe what, what do you mean by that? And how, I mean, as simple as that might sound, how can we consciously take that perspective? Okay. And that's an analogy. And, and the analogy of going one layer deeper is really saying the same thing as being outside and slightly elevated. So uh, if you're talking about your business, just as an example, talking about a business. So uh, you so many people are in the middle of their business mm -hmm. and they don't have a business. If they disappear, the business goes away because the business is them. Now you're an artist and a, a producer and I'm a writer. There's a certain amount of our lives we need to be in the middle of right. most, most of the people's lives in a small business. For example, my answering service, I was in the middle of everything. I could do everything. I could fix computers. I could hire people. I could take a deposit to the bank. I could talk the bank into a new loan. I, I could talk to an angry customer and calm them. Oh, I was, I was, you know, I was really proud of myself. It was so heroic. Uh, but you, you try to get outside of your business. So you're not in the middle of it and look down on it and kind of reach in figuratively speaking with your hands and manipulate those systems with the ultimate result of not wanting to be a, a master slave relationship with you being the slave to the master that is the business, the chaotic business itself. So I took my $21,000 business in and somebody offered me $14 million for it last week. Okay. Wow. And we have no debt. I mean, that, that's not, you know, Elon Musk territory at all, but it's a small business. And I, I don't even work two hours a month because my management staff is highly paid. They do the system strategy thing. And Diana and I have way more money than we need and way more time than we need. We do all this other stuff, <laughs> property management, fun, fun stuff. Walked my hounds this morning down in the canyons. I, I, I sat out, I stood out on the porch before we talked. I got uh, connected here before you did. Uh, brilliant. And I walked out on the couch and I looked, you can see this beautiful yard where my two hounds were out there with our two cats, the little cats. Uh, they, they all came to us by accident. And I looked around at our beautiful yard and I thought I'm going to go in and talk to this guy for a long time, long interview. And my life is exactly the way I want it. It really wow. is. It's not perfect. Yeah. I'm still unhappy for no reason at all, like most people. <laughs> but I, uh, I really am so pleased with the results of the system strategy in my life. Everything from the house we live in to talking to you, to uh, having this great bottle of water here. It's all, 
it really is all good. And I'll, t- I'll tell you, I'll tell our listeners this, your life may never be perfect because you can have, you've heard all the stories about you can have all the time and all the money in the world. You still may be unhappy. That's really true. But that's not my job. My job is to get people to have a lot of time and have a lot of money, extract themselves from the chaos, and then you figure it out from there. And I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying this, uh, having more money than you need and plenty of time goes a long way toward making a person happy and feeling in control of themselves and in a position to contribute like you do, Brilliant, and like I do, uh, to Brilliant, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, petition the outside world uh, to get a little bit better. Yeah. And it really is true. Uh, if you have enough time and you have enough money, it sure helps. If it doesn't make you happy, it sure helps. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt about that. I, I, yeah. uh, I remember reading once um, someone who writes about happiness talked about, uh, right, when certain needs aren't met, like the Maslow's hierarchy, when we don't yeah. have security, yeah. physical security, food, shelter, that kind of thing. The happiness is very, very low, understandably. But once we cross a certain threshold, then we really don't need that much to be happy. But one thing that's extremely important in our happiness is our our sense of autonomy of our lives, our sense to determine our own lives. Yeah. And and one of the things I think is remarkable is that we, and you talk a little bit about this in work, the system that many of us get so addicted to fire killing or firefighting, or just reacting to whatever problem comes up as a result of a poorly managed system right? That we don't ever really embrace our responsibility, the responsibility we have to create our experience of life, because it's so much easier to just always be putting out fires than to really ask maybe some of these higher level questions that are a privilege to be able to ask. I want to just acknowledge like, what is my purpose and what do I really want and so forth. But my contention is that many of us avoid really asking those questions because it is so much easier just to deal with whatever problem is right in front of us. What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah. uh, It's easier and it's very satisfying. Okay. So somebody calls from the other office, say you're in a business and they say, can you come down and help me with this computer problem? And you're able to do that, to walk into their office and fix. How satisfying is that? Yeah. You're somebody else. Yeah. It's heroic is what it is. And so you surround yourself with challenges, the same damn challenges all the time, even though they're scattered all around like a Renaissance man kind of a thing. Uh, And you're able to solve all these problems with satisfaction all day long. And you're right. You put yourself in a position where you're taking care of the easy stuff and you never do the hard stuff. And, And part of what my book talks about is documentation. Yeah. Documentation of your systems. And that's the, that's the hard part for most people. Oh, I've got to do something. I can't just have this thing twist in my head. Well, actually, you can have this thing twist in your head, but then there's some work to do after that, and it will fit with this new systems mindset. The hard stuff is to sit down and document your processes. And that's what we did that next morning. I, I documented, and I'm sure you remember, Brilliant, if you just read the book not too long ago, is went down and there was one big problem and we spent, I spent about eight hours of my time, you know, and this is all new to me, but it was 52 steps to solve this problem. And it immediately, and I go into very good detail in the book, uh, but that saved me two hours of week, a week of time that I could get this process and give it to somebody else. And I haven't done, done it since 1999. And I, I can't remember how many, 40 hour a week work week set is, but do the math two hours a week since 1999. I haven't done that calculation later lately. Yeah, but. I mean, it's over 400 hours. So yeah. you got right yeah. there, basically, so, you know, yeah, it's a quarter. Gotta be two yeah, hours. No, did I say two hours a week? Yeah. Two hours a week, two hours a day. Oh, two hours a day. Yeah. Was it two hours a day or two hours? No, it was two hours a week. Okay, 400 hours, I'll take you. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. of another process. That's, that's more the than point is, I hours. we did that system, that process got documented, perfected, and we keep tweaking it. We're even tweaking it to this day. Uh, it's 12 pages long now. It was, a, it was two pages long 
back then. Uh, but our receivables person, and it had to do with our receivables, goes through it every time she does a billing. And there's never a mistake, never an omission. She yeah. knows how it works because she's got the systems mindset, Teresa. And uh, then we did that over and over again with all the other processes. The next process was how do we answer the phones? Uh, we created a language, a, uh, a series of acronyms. We documented it all. Took us took us more than a month to put that together. Uh, but boy, did that improve things. And then we did it over and over and over. And within six months, my 100-hour week, work weeks are down to 40. And That's then it awesome. kept dropping, 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 dropping to the point where I could write a book, do these other businesses. And here I am today, uh, maybe two hours a month. And our, our gross revenues now are literally... Well, I, I don't know, a hundred, a hundred times what they used to be, something that's, like that. That's yeah, awesome. A hundred times. Yeah, and, and to look at all those benefits of increased revenues and profits, decreased, um, you know, effort or brain damage, as you might yes. say, the ability <laughs> to, to delegate, the ability to give other people a pathway of yeah. contributing, participating, you know, and, and you talk about this is really resonated with me where you say, the single major operational difference between the owner of a large successful business and the owner of a small struggling one. You ask it as a question, right? To the reader. Will you talk about that? What is the difference between a major, you know, like a, a large successful business and a small struggling one? You know, that paragraph, brilliant. I spent, I, I spent hours and hours crafting that paragraph to explain it. And mm -hmm. uh, I got a lot of satisfaction out of it, uh, but I'll paraphrase it here. And that is that uh, the difference between a small struggling business and a big successful business is documentation. Because a small struggling business, the wife does it this way, the husband does it this way, the new, the new guy does it this way. Everybody has a different way of doing things and it's chaos. Yeah. And if you go to a successful business, 100% of the time, 100% of the time, and I call it successful business is where the owner isn't in the middle of everything every day, okay? They have documented their processes. Uh, whether you like it or not, <laughs> or whether you want it to be that way or not, doesn't matter. That is the truth. That's one of the small uh, truths of business is the small struggling business will always be a small struggling business if everything's ad hoc yeah. all the time. I don't care what kind of business it is. And we've handled over 300 different businesses in the consulting company that we have. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter what kind of business it is, but that's an absolute fact. And the people that come to us, and I don't, I'm not connected financially to Josh Fonger's consulting business, Work the System Consulting, and people can find that on workthesystem.com if they want hands-on help. But they're all the same. He works with them individually. He works on one, yeah, one on one or in group format. It's always the same. These are people who have never documented anything. Boring, yeah. but true. You yeah. got to document your processes. And the, and the beautiful thing is what happened to me was for the first few months, I did the documentation myself, but you really need your people to do it. Right. Then they're bought into it, especially uh, you don't want to be doing documentation for years and years and giving it to people. They won't do it. They need to they need to have skin in the game. So you show your people how to do the documentation. First, this happens. Second, this happens. Third, this happens. Everything happens over time in a step by step process. You just write it down. Well, do I need special software? Well, we've got software for that. That's fine. But you don't need special software. It's just one, this happens to the, then you have say 25 steps. We have a seven step process brilliant for answering the phone at the front desk, right? And uh, uh, you say your name, I forget how it is right now, <laughs> that's a good bit, but I think it's uh, good morning, step one, this is Sandy or whoever's answering the phone. Uh, Centratel, you've reached Centratel, how can I help you? And then listen, listen, and then write down what they say. And then there's a sequence for saying goodbye. And it has to do with whether we need to get back to them or deliver a compliment or whatever it is. And so every process that is recurring and is human based is documented. And of course, when you have software uh, engendered processes, <laughs> The software is a document, right? Yeah. And so if you have a problem in the software, you need to add a step, you go in and you do that. 
And we have software engineers, uh, in, one in Romania and one in Italy, that that's all they're doing is working on our platforms and doing the software documentation. Uh, and then we have our operational staff who are, they're not with paper and pen, of course, it's all software, but there's always a process to either be created at this point, not too many, but uh, there's always a, a process to be tweaked to a higher level of perfection. And that's how we operate. And people don't walk around, you know, looking at their laptop to see what to do next. The fact that they're documented and your people have done the documentation, they don't need to go see what step four is and step five. They know what it is in their heads. Yeah. But the new person comes in, you say, look, do this. And you hand it to them. And that's what I did that day with that first process is one day after we had perfected it, it had taken, I think, a couple of weeks to get it the way we want it. I just handed it to somebody. I said, go do that. And the litmus test is, can you hand it to somebody? Is the wording precise enough that you could take somebody off the street? Average intelligence, not on drugs, can type. Uh, can they do the process in your business? That's that's the degree of simplicity to which that you want to meet uh, when you create a working procedure, uh, mm -hmm. what we call a working procedure. Yeah. So that is the difference between a small struggling business and a large uh, successful business. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, a question that I'm sure you encounter and you dealt with yourself as someone who owns and has worked inside and works on uh, your business now is how, when you're so busy, especially for people who don't have a team or they have a very small team, how do you make the time to actually document these things instead of just constantly dealing with the demands of the business? You, uh, well, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so not a great question in the sense it's an impossible task, but a great question for somebody to who's watching this to start you, if you can see your separate systems and you can find one that's dysfunctional, this mm -hmm. never seems to go right within your business, for example. Right. Uh, you separate it. You will find the time to fix it. Okay. You will find the time to fix it. And uh, you, the heroic part of this is finding the time to fix that system. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, it may be just a, a half hour to put a procedure together, or it might be 10 minutes or it might be two hours. But when you see that process is no longer dysfunctional, all your people see the process, the document and approved it and added something here and took something else. When all your people have it, and I don't know if you have a hundred people or six people or mm -hmm. one person helps you, but uh, once you solve that problem with this methodology, you get very excited about finding a freaking time <laughs> to yeah. do this work. Yeah. And so the big hurdle, and I talk about it in the book, is to do the heroic thing. Take a minute, sit at your desk quietly, take a deep breath, and uh, think about what your most dysfunctional problem is. And then take care of it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the results of that. And this is how I got from 100 hours a week down to 40 and now down to two. Every time something came up that took any of my time, that uh, besides major overall R&D, which I need to do with my staff, but the, all the little stuff has been, been uh, uh, automated, delegated, or deleted to the point where I work two hours a month. How long, did it, how long would it take me to take that company now with what I know? and this book to guide me that I have, uh, it took me about five years to straighten my business out. Two of those years, years were lost to a, uh, uh, a major lawsuit. I was, the, <laughs> I was, I like to say the protagonist. I was the petitioner, but I lost two years because of a bad uh, international uh, partnership relationship I had. So it really took maybe three years to fix mm -hmm. my business. But in refining things and following the guidelines here, I would have fixed that business in six months now. Wow. Uh, and and even, even with stumbling around trying to figure this out, I didn't even have a name for the systems mindset yet. In six months, I had gone from 100 hours a week to 40, and my health started to improve. And I talk about how my health got really bad. I had these hormone imbalances, and and I'm a pretty athletic guy, but uh, I uh, I was killing myself. And it took two years to get my some of my 
basic hormones back to normal. Uh, and uh, that was with a combination of prescription drugs and over-the-counter drugs and getting enough sleep and eating correctly. I was single at the time. Uh, but it, it can happen. And here I am today with the life I want to lead rather than the middle of this much, much bigger, but even more by light years complex business that yeah. I had back then. Yeah. Well, good, good for you for yeah. really making that happen because I know, um, and you and I talked a few days ago before we did this interview and I shared with you a little of my experience of my dad, who was, a uh, an entrepreneur that he didn't take care of himself this way. Yeah. He died with a whole host of complications that were the result of high stress, long hours, poor diet, little sleep, not going to the doctor and so forth. And you, and I hope many people listening, not only, you know, like see the possibility, but do what you're doing, create, not only create the life you love, but really taking care of yourself along the way. And I do think, you know, there is, as you well know, there's no magic wand. There's no silver bullet. There's no single person we're going to hire. That's going to manage all these problems that's for right. us and protect our businesses. Yeah. We, you know, that's a fallacy. We sometimes allow ourselves to indulge in, but, but this thing about um, documentation, I just want to, I want to stay with this for a moment because this idea that, you know, first of all, we can build a machine, so to speak. And we, it's almost a time machine where this investment of time up front to document, it can be a shift in gears. It can be uncomfortable. It can be unfamiliar, that kind of thing. It's a different mode of working to be the hero, put out the fire, but it makes these otherwise abstract or ephemeral processes more concrete. You talk about that in the book. And, and I really appreciate that as a, as an, I don't know, as an image, as an idea that we're taking something that is intangible, and we're somehow giving it substance by writing it down, not to mention that we're scrutinizing, right? We're yeah. scrutinizing it and refining it and, and hope collaborating, get on the same page. But will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's one of my favorite uh, nuances of the systems mindset. How do you take an organic process? Okay, how you answer the phone in the office. Sounds like an organic process, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah anybody knows how to answer a phone. Come on. Yeah, right. I want to be myself and, yeah. and everything. Well, you can still be yourself, but have a perfect script that, that your whole group agrees is the best way to answer the phone. You don't leave out your name. You pleasant. The uh, Step one is to put a smile on your face, actually, because oh, your, yes. your voice will sound better. So you have all these organic processes. And let's just take it, any kind of business that's small and it's the entrepreneur just started it. And he's got more energy than anybody in the world. And he's a smart person and he or she, and, and, uh, and they jump right in and do the work. Got to get more customers, got to take care of the customers, got to develop this process, got to develop that process. Those are organic processes. Mm -hmm. In other words, they fluctuate. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the business gets a little bigger, it gets a little bigger. And pretty soon there's a half a dozen people working and they're all doing stuff a different way. And that's chaos. And so how do you take an organic process and make it a mechanical process? And I'm about mechanics. I'm not about feeling good and then fixing your life. I'm about fixing your life. And I'm telling you, you'll feel good when you do that. I'm a mechanical guy. So the mechanical part of this is to identify the problematic organic systems. Those are the ones that have no basis in reality, uh, tangibly, and turn it into something tangible, which is seven steps on a piece of paper yeah. that your crew all agrees is the best way to do it. And then you all agree you'll do it that way. And if anybody has an idea of improving it, please let us know because we will instantly fix it if we all agree. And moving quickly is very important in this in these procedures. And these working procedures, these tangible now, these tangible working procedures can be changed on a dime. It doesn't have to go to a committee in a small yeah. business. Uh, and a manager should always maintain... I would hope the manager tries to maintain enough power within the organization to tweak a process without having to go check with the boss. Now, yeah. some of them you have to, of course, uh, and I did it for a long time. I checked every single one of them, but I haven't checked one in years mm -hmm. uh, that they've come up with back there, but uh, in my headquarters in Bend, Oregon. Uh, so the tangibility is everything. Brilliant. It's it's it makes it real. Otherwise, it's just kind of an, a good feeling and a good idea. And uh, 
That's that's an important point. And that, yeah. that's what documentation does. It, it gives de- tangibility, gives you something to freaking work with. Right. right? Yeah. Something, <laughs> something else something to change, something to make better. Absolutely. Yeah. And something else. I mean, there's there's a lot in it that that really makes a lot of sense about, especially if you have it from the ground up, from the front line, the people doing the process are the ones who originate it. Not only do they have more buy in but it will probably be a better result than if it was some manager somewhere far removed from the customers or the, the clients is, is one. But another that I love about it is that, you know, somebody once told me before someone can meet your expectation, they have to know what it is. And by putting it down on paper and saying, this is what I expect yeah. of you. And by the way, it's not just this top down unilateral thing. It's again, if you have a way of improving it, by all means, let us know. And I think the immediacy that you just talked about is important too, because if it becomes bureaucratic, if it becomes like something that is delayed and goes through committees or whatever, or sits on the owner's desk or waits for his or her response, then I think it will lose. It will probably have the opposite effect of, of being, you know, something that's actually useful in delivering value. Yep. So all of that makes you want your a ton of sense. To do it. I can give you a great illustration of this. You know, I love Jordan Peterson. Okay. Mm-hmm. I love Jordan. One of his greatest abilities is to tell stories. He's the analogy king of the world, but he's also great at telling stories. So let me tell you a story that illustrates this real well. So I had a one-on-one consultation with a big fertilizer company in Alberta, Canada. I spent Mm -hmm. a month up there. I think I came back to Oregon once when I was living in Oregon, Uh, but it was just belly deep into the process. And he really He's, I talk about Mike in the beginning of the book where he's the one that said uh, dysfunction is gold. And we can talk about that in a minute. But so he had a warehouse, fertilizer, uh, forklifts and guys like eight guys or 12 guys. I forget how many. But anyway, I was working with them out there and they really got it, too. And Mike was a powerful leader is a powerful leader. And uh, they got it to this uh, working procedure thing. And what they had was a procedure for something that happened about moving stuff around in this big warehouse, and big, heavy, you know, loads on a forklift, moving it from here to there and this and that. And they said, uh, the new guy came in. So they brought a new guy in and they had been operating off this procedure, 20 some steps. I remember that. And uh, this is how we do it. And he actually had a, this new guy had a lot of experience at, a num- at another company in a warehouse. And of course, the new guy always wants to impress everybody and earn his keep. And he said, and they gave it to him. This is how we do it. No, I'll do it my way. He said, no, you got to do it this way. No, I'm going to do it my way. You guys hired me. I'm, I'm probably more experienced than most of you guys. Okay, go ahead. So they worked a few days and he did it his way. He did it his way. And then the boss took him in. He said, I just want you to try it this way. Okay. Do it exactly this way. And what I want, and this is a key, brilliant. This is key. He said to him to get him on his side, punch holes in it. Find out where we can improve this process and let us know what you think of it all together. I know you I know you didn't want to do it at first, but let's take your experience and put it into this process and see if we make our process better. Turn him loose. A couple of days later, the guy came back. He said, this is really good. <laughs> and I would fix and step between step 13 and 14. I would put another step in to do this. And the guys and the crew, the guys, the bottom line guys, all oh, they had a meeting and they went through it and they went through it. And they went through. This guy was totally on board. He contributed. He was happy. Everybody was happy. And the process was faster and more efficient and safer, of course. Wow. Uh, so that that happens over and over and over again with the new new person that comes in to a process uh, operated business. And you ask them to take a look at this punch. Hole. I like the, I love the term punch holes in it. I don't know yeah. why I use it all the time. Punch holes in it. Let us know what we can do. But if you go top down, like you were talking about before, brilliant, top down, military works because they have guns. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And military jails. That's the way it has to be. I mean, you can't do that in the military. You've got to have a real chain of command and you still have your chain of command in the business. But the bottom up with the guys 
and girls, <laughs> ladies on the bottom, writing the procedures and running them up through management so management can do a final approval if it's, if it's an important enough procedure. That's the way to get everybody on board and that's the way to build a team. I just, uh, one of our people retired from the answering service. She answered phones for 29 years. Wow. Me. And then one just had a 25 year anniversary two weeks ago and another one uh, a year before her had a 25 year anniversary. But most of my people have been with me a long, long time. And it's not because somebody has got a bull whip and telling them what to do. It's because wow. they get to contribute. And that's how we're the best. We are in our 800 competitors. We're the best. I don't care how, what the measurement is, error rate, rate of pay, what we charge customers, uh, number of, administrative staff, you know, per dollar, whatever you want to measure, we are the best. And then the reason is, is because we have this bottom up strategy. It's not a democracy at all. It's more of a benevolent dictatorship, but everybody gets to come from the bottom up and feel like they're being heard. And when they do make a suggestion, something happens, something does happen. And maybe somebody will go back to them and say, we can't do that because of this. Oh, okay. And then I understand, but not usually. Usually it's something that can be improved yeah. quickly. Yeah. There's, there's so much, there's so much value in that. And and we, as humans, we want structure. I mean, as much as we resist it, <laughs> I think of the simple example of kids and bedtime, having an established bedtime, and then, you know, there's something to push against, but especially in the workplace, we want to know what's expected of us. We want to know if we're winning, right? We want to feel a sense of enjoyment and meaning and, and connectedness in our work and knowing that this isn't dependent on, you know, how I feel or if yeah. somebody else is going to do it the same way or whatever. And I think also that thing that you talked about, about dysfunction as gold or seeing problems as red flags. This is to me, another real value that comes from taking a systems mindset of not just, right. I love Tony Robbins view of quality problems. <laughs> He'll talk about, you know, that there is yeah. such thing. And even to go another step aside to recognize that happiness and problems have no necessary relationship as we touched on a little earlier, right? When we take this more empowered view of, Hey, if something's not working in this business, if I'm experiencing dysfunction, if there's a problem that's pointing to something, it's not just, you know, it's not just an effing problem. It's like, there's an opportunity there. Right. And there's something I think deeply empowering in that as a whole, like as a whole come from as a whole attitude related to the systems mindset. Well, yeah. And um, as you start down this road, we call them red flags for improvement, right? Oh, there's something we can fix. And so there's two steps. There's fix the immediate problem. Maybe it's with a customer, but then examine how that problem came up with a customer. Maybe there's something you can repair over here in a process. So red flags for improvement. And you get a lot of them at the beginning. We hardly have any at all now. We even have a process of taking care of complaints. We're going to call back in a day, three days, two weeks, in a month, and see if that happened again. Can you imagine the loyalty you instill in your clients when you do that? Because yeah. usually you call and complain and they blame you. Well, a lot of times, depending yeah, on who it is, don't respond. maybe it is your fault, but a lot of times yeah. it's not. And yeah. so we go back, even if it is our fault, we go back and we, we uh, uh, check in with the client. So that red flag for improvement was a complaint. Yeah. Somewhere many years ago, we put our heads together and said, let's come up with a process. Uh, this red flag for improvement says we have to have a structured, solid, bulletproof uh, complaint procedure. And that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And so reminders come up. We have a very customized platform uh, that we operate from that takes a whole bunch of different databases and bring it, it brings it in. But the person who's handling that comp particular complaint gets reminders, call so-and-so at this number about that problem that happened there. And you can go there to see what the problem is. And so we don't lose a lot of accounts when we have a problem. <laughs> we, uh, when we have problems and everybody has problems, the answering service business is wrought with uh, there's so many potholes for, for failure in yeah. so many moving parts in this kind of a business that you really have to have that or your life will be hell. It'll be yeah. chaos. Yeah. I, and I, th I think that's true of any business worth growing, any business worth continuing, yeah. no doubt. And for people listening, they might, you know, who, especially are in that situation of being a solopreneur, a fledging entrepreneur, maybe they've been in it like you were a decade or more but they haven't, they certainly haven't perfected it. 
they're, they're, they're just kind of overwhelmed and they're hearing the promise of adopting the systems mindset of documenting things. But one thing that we haven't touched on that I think might serve them is to also talk about what I would call like the first order of work with creating a strategic outcome and creating um, general yeah. operating principles and how those fit into this, because it could be easy to get all excited and just start, start drafting things. And there might be value in that. But I think if that happens within the context of these other documents, so will you talk about what those are and why they might yeah. matter for somebody? So in the book, there's three parts. The part one is getting the systems mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part two is documentation. And you're right. The first documentation has to be, well, what, what you know, brilliant. Uh, but there's three, three documents. So the first is a strategic objective. And very quickly, what that is, it's, uh, I'm not a big fan of mission statements. We want our customers to be happy. We want our employees to be happy. We're going to be the best we can be. It's BS. It's crap. Everybody wants that. But if you have a page of what you want to get to, and kind of when and how you're going to do it and what even what you're not going to do, 300 words, uh, that's called a strategic objective. And you always go back to that. You always go back to that. And of course, that document has to be done by the owner of the business. Run it by your people, but it's got to be your vision. You're the solopreneur. You're the entrepreneur. Uh, so you get a, uh, you know what we call it? And you can compare it to this is really <laughs> this is really cool. I think uh, the documentation of the United States of America. So mm -hmm. that would be the Declaration of Independence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next thing is your operating principles. Okay. These are the things we're going to do. These are the things we're going to not do. Uh, we have thirty of them. Uh, no, no rats nests, figuratively or uh, uh, physically. All right. And there's, there's a whole in there in the back in the appendix to the book. Uh, and it sounds like I'm trying to sell my book. I, it's, it's less than one half a percent of my total income is book sales and everything related with the book. I do this because I love to do it. Uh, but in the back of the book, and you can even get the appendix, appendices uh, if you have the audible, there's a way to go to a link and get those in, in hard copy. Uh, it, it, we list the 30 principles that are what we call, uh, let's see, we would call them, uh, I'm trying to think of the phraseology we've used. I, I think you use a term somewhere about guidelines for making decisions. Guidelines. Yeah, I haven't talked about this in so long. Guidelines for decision making. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right. Because uh, these are, they're not quite talking. values per se, although they're, they're a lot like values. And we know we can't legislate everything, right? Like we're probably not going to create, uh, a procedure for every single thing that would ever happen in our business. Some of them that recur, it's important to, but for others, it works well enough to just have a set of general operating principles. Exactly. So for those things you don't have a process for, you're exactly right. <laughs> Thank you for helping me with my book. Uh, number one, company decisions conform to the strategic objective, 30 principles and working procedure documents. And then I'll pick number 10, uh, the money we save or waste is not monopoly money, exclamation point. You know, uh, we are careful not to devalue the worth of a dollar just because it has has to do with the business. Right. Um, and another simple one would be. Sequence and priority are critical. We work on the most important tasks first. And that's how you identify the first ones, the dis most dysfunctional things yeah. in your business. You identify those and solve those problems first. And then I say we spend maximum time on non-urgent slash important tasks via Stephen Covey's time matrix philosophy. So mm -hmm. I spent an awful lot of time putting these together and uh, everybody can, they don't have to have 30. You can have yeah. four, you can yeah. have 62. Uh, 30 seemed about right to me. That's the second series uh, and that, again, has to be done by the leader and approved and and not approved, uh, commented upon by the staff. Right. Yep. And then the third are where most of the work is done forever is the working procedures where you have documented each separate procedure on how it's supposed to be. Yep. Uh, and it doesn't sit up on a three ring binder in a shelf. And we've seen that. 
<laughs> we had a guy in California uh, kind of read through the book quick and people always want to start with the working procedures. He spent a couple of years writing working procedures himself. And uh, he had binder after binder on, on this wall, of, you know, in his office and nobody ever looked at him because they, they were too busy. Yeah, <laughs> and they no, didn't have no relevance to reality. <laughs> it was a, it was a horrible error. Uh, yeah. actually, but the working procedures are ultimately, uh, uh, created by your people and approved by you as yeah. the leader or the, your manager who's designated to do that. So those are three primary documents. And when we talked about documentation earlier, that's kind of what we're talking about, but you got to spend, oh, you know, four to six hours, uh, maximum putting together your strategic objective, Right. And then um, your principles kind of you put and you're not going to sit down in one setting for four to six hours. You're going to yeah. do it over a set of days. But I would say four to six hours of massaging, getting it perfect. You really want it to be perfect. And it will tweak. You will tweak it over the first few years, literally, to yeah. get it closer to what you want. And then the operating principles come together pretty quickly. I carried a piece of paper in my pocket for weeks and weeks and wrote down ideas for them. Oh yeah. Uh, we don't want any rat's nests figuratively or physically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote it down and I added to it. I worked on it. I don't know how many hours I spent, but it took, I bet I took six weeks to kind of get the basics together. But then again, with those, those got tweaked. Yeah. And some of my staff would say, what about you always saying this, Sam, what about that? And I'd say, Oh yeah, I forgot about that. You're right <laughs> about that. And then the working procedures. So those are the three documents, but you got to spend the time. This is the heroic part in doing the strategic objective and doing the principles and doing that first couple of working procedures. And you're on your way to freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's the promise of the book, right? To make more and work less. And, and it doesn't happen by accident. It is possible. There is a method and there, there are probably many methods, but this is one. And yes. you proved it in your life and to many, many clients. I want to go back for just a moment to the analogy that you were laying out about how the strategic objective is like the declaration of independence. Yeah. Right. And then the general operating principles is this. Oh, the I, I dropped that thread. Yeah. That's your constitution. Yep. Yep. And then the uh, working procedures are the laws of the land, right? Yeah. State by state or federal laws, uh, so, yeah, it's it's funny that our founders, maybe the most brilliant gathering of men, of course, ever, anywhere, uh, kind of came up with the same thing. And I came up different. I, I, I'm kind of smug about it, but I came up with the three documents and somebody later in my office said, this is just like this is just like our founding documentation. Well, there's some logic to it, I guess. And uh but you have to have a direction. If you're going from A to B, you got to identify freaking B. Yeah. You know, that sure. is the Declaration of Independence. You've got to have some rules of the road, some, some basic uh, theories that everybody agrees on. There's yeah. your constitution. And then um, the laws of the land change all the time and they're added to and subtracted, mostly added to in this country lately. Yeah. But uh, the, it's the same thing. And what you were saying before, Brilliant, uh, this isn't to take away from Tony Robbins or Stephen Covey or any other great guys out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have, uh, This is an underlying, this is underneath those philosophies. And even, even whatever religion you might be following, mm -hmm. uh, it's underneath. It doesn't replace any of it. Mm -hmm. And so I have a video out there. If people go to the website, workthesystem.com and sign up, one of the first videos I send out, and they're all very short, uh, but it talks about that. Uh, the second or the third one, I forget. Uh, it says, whatever you believe now, whatever menu you're following, politics, left, right, mm -hmm. uh, whatever spiritual thing you do, if you do anything at all, maybe you're an atheist. But what, whatever you believe, mm -hmm. just put it over here for a minute. And travel down this road for a little while with me, not long, just travel down along. You're going to come back to those things probably. You're not mm -hmm. going to abandon a bunch of stuff. You're right. probably going to come back to some semblance of whatever you believed before, but you'll have this underlying mechanical grasp of your life now. Yeah. Where when you're following a menu, 
You're following a menu. You say, okay, number four on the menu, and I'm, I'm being ridiculous. Number four on the menu says to do this, so I guess I'll do this, or I'll believe this, or I'll believe that. I don't care if you're a Republican or a liberal or, or you're in a, in a Kashmir, Azad Kashmir parliament <laughs> or the Pakistani government or, or Chinese or whatever you are. Whatever you believe, you'll go back to that, but you'll go back to that with a, a better grasp on mechanical reality. And as I said before, I'm about mechanical reality. I believe you fix your life first mechanically. You can't, you have to fix your life mechanically before you have the resources and the energy to enjoy life and, yeah. and the time and the money. So fix your mechanical problem first. And so much brilliant, you know, it. so much as you got to do, you know, okay, I got the systems mindset. I, I, I admit to that, but follow my philosophy and your whole life will be improved and you got to follow this menu. Right. Oh, no, no, no. That's that's not the way it works because you're still an individual and you still have to operate. So fix your mechanics. You know, maybe you're in a relationship. Let's let's make this a little easier. Uh, you're in a you have a girlfriend. <laughs> OK, you're 22. You've got a girlfriend. She's been your girlfriend for four years. She's driving you crazy. And I don't mean to appear to be a misogynist. Maybe I should turn it around. OK, <laughs> you're the girl and the guy's an idiot. OK, but you love him. He's handsome. He's got money and everything. But you get the systems mindset and you realize, really, he's dragging you down, girl. He's dragging you down. And when you get the systems mindset, one day you'll say, sayonara, man, I'm yeah. done with you. I didn't realize that you had invaded and infected every area of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe a little extreme as far as a business goes. It may be. Here's another one. Uh, you go into a small business. We have this happen all the time. And I'll, I'll say the brother-in-law, it's not always the brother-in-law. You go into a small business. There's a guy who runs a business. His wife works with him and the brother-in-law is the sales manager and has been there forever. Mm -hmm. and he stinks. He's lazy. He doesn't do anything. And you talk to the owner, you know, we're talking to him about doing a one-on-one -on -one consultation or group, group coaching, whatever. And we take a look at the business and he tells Josh, Josh Fonger is my guy who does all the, the hands-on stuff. Josh, the, the big problem I got in the business is my brother-in-law and I can't talk to my wife about it because he's family and everything. And mm -hmm. Josh will say, look, if you're not prepared, it might not come to this, but it very well might. Mm -hmm. You got to say goodbye to this guy mm -hmm. and work it out with your wife because he's dragging your whole operation down. And that's where you're deleting a system, deleting a system that's just been dragging everything down. And uh, and I, of course, it follows down into the less uh, onerous areas of a certain procedure has a glitch in it. And you fix that little glitch and the procedure now works like a charm. And it's written down now, too. Uh, but you can see you isolate you isolate things and you do it with documentation, but you got to know where you're going. You got to know generally what everybody's going to agree on. And then you have to document these processes. And that's, those are the three uh, documents in part two of this book. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense. And it's a cohesive system. And sometimes, you know, these things, they don't occur to us or they might not even be obvious if they are pointed out. But when we see, that there are people who have applied them and have achieved success. And especially when what we're doing isn't working as well as it could. I mean, it's a, it's a great option. So maybe, maybe the last thing I want to, I have two last questions in this part of the interview. One of them is the difference between a job and a business. You, yeah. you kind of touched on this a little earlier in our conversation, but will you describe how you see the difference between a job and a business? Sure. So a job you may be paying the taxes, you may be doing the workers' comp, you may be hiring the people, and you're calling it a business. But if you have to be there, it's a job. And I talk about, I don't know how far you got in the book, uh, uh, Brilliant, but uh, there's a story in there about a guy loves to fish, and he went to Alaska in his 50s, and he bought a fishing boat. That's seven hundred thousand dollars. I don't know what he paid. It was an enormous amount of money for him at the time, and uh, all he wanted to do was take people out and enjoy fishing. Well, it was halibut fishing in Homer, Alaska, 
Okay, the reels have motors on them, okay? <laughs> you hook a halibut and it, 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 the electric motor winds the halibut up. You throw it in the boat. Oh, it's big halibut. That's great. Uh, but he had to he had to take his boat through the surf, <laughs> the really rough seas for two hours to get to this place that he had GPS located where all the halibut were. We all got our limits immediately. I think it was two fish at that time. Uh, and then he took us all back. And then so the guy had got up at four o'clock because he also houses the fishermen who come up from the States. Right. This guy. This guy was unhappy. OK, really, really an unhappy person. And so that is a job that is not a business. That's a that's horrible. A business is where, like me, my I've got 60 people all spread across the United States and in Europe. And I don't do anything. That's a business. I could sell that business. Right. I could sell that business tomorrow if I want, but the income's too good. We're a 30% plus profit margin. And I've been doing it for 40 years and I love doing it. I want to keep doing it. I love the people who work for me. That is a business. But, you know, one of the defining characteristics is, can you sell your business? So this guy couldn't sell his business because he was the business. Right. Yeah, he could sell his boat. It's totally dependent on him. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important concept. Uh, brilliant. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. It's, and it's one, I think is people, you know, have a frame because again, entrepreneurs, we've all heard this idea of work on the business, not in the business and so forth. But to me, there was something that was really uh, useful about asking, wait, am I, am I working a job here or am I owning a business? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really Oh, really so cool. many people own businesses, but they don't really, uh, they think yeah. they do, but they don't. If, you know, the key question is, can you sell it tomorrow? Yeah. Is there ca positive cash flow? Do you have to be there or not? And so many people have to be there. And here's the thing. And here's what I was talking about earlier. I have to write these books. Call it a job if you want. Uh, you have to be there as the guy who interviews people like me. That's a job if you want to call it that. But yeah. it's a little tiny fraction of time, right? Yeah. Compared to the whole week uh, of what we do things. Uh, an entertainer, Derek Jeter with the Yankees. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but that was a job. Yeah. Uh, great job. And I talk about that. Oh, yeah. You found that in the book, the uh, chapter I have on, on the great parts. The gr why having a job is not a real bad thing. Right. If you want to have the security and all the other things I've listed in there. Uh, but if you want to have a business, this is what you have to do. And so my whole thing is for people who own businesses and want to break free, stop the chaos, get out of it and uh, have a life. Yeah. So I had another guy who loved to mountain climb. He, uh, when I last saw him was maybe 15 years ago, I climbed uh, Mount Rainier with him. He was a guide. Mm -hmm. And it was his 300th climb, a 300 second climb or something like that up around or because he loved a mountain climb when he was in his 20s. OK, now the guy's in his 40s. OK, I'm sorry. I don't care how motivated you are, but things start to slow down after a while. And he was going to go for 600. And I thought, my God. And then I, I used to race bicycles, the same thing. I want to be in bicycles all my life. Well, what? Have run a bicycle shop? Is that really what you want to do? Why not find there's so many businesses out there that are mismanaged Buy some dumb business, like an answering service, you know, some really standard, boring business. I shouldn't say dumb. I say boring business, like an answering service and fix it with the systems mindset and then go climb your mountains or, you know, go take a whack at K2 or in the next state, whatever, or take your bike out every night. Cause you got time to do it and have fun with your friends. But to try to make a career out of something that you're really good at and something you really love is a lot of times is a mistake yeah. because it turned it into something that it wasn't before. That's not the business you want. That's the fun you want to have with your life. The business might be buying a HVAC company somewhere and fixing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that could be. Yeah, that I think that's really a, a useful insight. Well, Sam, I know we've covered so much already about work, the system and, and some of these philosophies and some of these practices, but before we transition to another part of the interview, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you, you want to talk about or you think might be of service to the listener? 
Oh, yeah, I'm going to say get my book. Uh, <laughs> I really have refined the book over 14 years. It's in its fourth edition. I'm very proud of this that came out last year. Uh, yeah. And a lot of it's grammatical. I've had actual thousands, actually thousands of little improvements over the third edition in here. It really is a good compendium. And I wrote it. I started to write the book as a guide for my people at Centratel. Okay. Mm -hmm. It developed into something I realized that anybody could use. And I had such great success with the process that 14 years later, uh, it's really refined. You probably really need to start with the book. So you can download the first four, uh, all the front matter, the first four chapters for free at workthesystem.com and get on the mailing list. That would be the first thing I'd do. Yeah, there is one more thing, um, two more things actually, but um, the book really is a solid compendium of this, of what we're talking about today. Uh, brilliant. What I do with people regarding the systems mindset, if I'm talking to a group, uh, we kind of go into a meditation thing, uh, mm -hmm. sort of a meditation thing. Keep your eyes open and everything, but look around you wherever you are and start to identify the separate systems. Okay. So for me, there's this light that you can't see. Uh, there's the, the uh, heating and air conditioning. It's very hot here in Kentucky today. So the cool air is coming out. There's my dog, Jesse, right here. Oh. <laughs> and Pearl's in the other room. She'll be joining us in a minute. But they're separate systems too, right? A book, all these books, this is a system. This is a process. Yep. Uh, so you visualize wherever you are, or if you're in a car, the cars that are coming by you are separate systems. The mm -hmm. people who are driving them are separate from the cars. And of course, they're all separate from each other. Yep. Your liver is separate from, as I said, your lungs. Mm -hmm. and your, your brain is separate from your mouth. They all work together. I get that. But they're all separate. Mm -hmm. And so start to visualize the separate systems in your life. That's how you get to the systems mindset. And for some people, it happens like that as they're reading the pages. Mm -hmm. And for other people, it takes a while. Now, my guy, Josh, who's been with me for 12 years, 12 years, Josh Fonger, <laughs> he's, uh, he's got an MBA. He's a smart guy. And uh, he's just moved from his dream uh, house on Kauai in Hawaii uh, to uh, last week to uh, he's moved to Tennessee. Wow. And uh, so he runs all my consulting and coaching. And again, I'm not financially connected to him. I gave him the business. But after working for me for a few weeks and this again, again, this was about 12 years ago, he came into the office one day. He said, Sam, I think I'm going crazy. Uh, I said, well, what's, what's the problem? He says, the systems mindset thing. I see everything as separate systems and it's making me crazy. I see my kids as separate systems. I see my wife as a separate system. I see my car. I see the radio as being separate from the gas pedal. It's, I think I'm, I think I'm going to be overwhelmed. I think I'm going crazy. And I kind of laughed and I said, and then he said, uh, how long do you, I, I said, this will, this too shall pass because you're now, you now have a more accurate view. He says, oh yeah, this is, I see this is the way the world is put together. Uh -huh. This was 12 years ago and he's running all my stuff now. And then he said, I remember him asking me, he said, how long will it take to where I don't think my brain's going to explode? <laughs> I said, I don't know, give it a few weeks or something, but you're not going to be able to go back to what it was before. So you might as well just get used to it. Well, it took him uh, less time than that, but he still remains to be, he still continues to be amazed at the effectiveness of it and the reality of seeing things as separate, separate. Oh. And we, you know how we are it's from the sixties, we're all one and all this. I was at Woodstock so, and I did the drugs. So I've got my credentials <laughs> to talk like this, uh, but uh we aren't all one. I mean, you want to go down to the granular uh, atom level? Yeah, we're all one. Great. And how good does that do you? But the truth is we're all separate. And uh, all the things in our lives are separate. The way the water comes out of the water spout out in the kitchen out here doesn't have anything to do with me going over there and turning the lights on. Nothing. And that's a perfect illustration. You know, I could go... Uh, we've got an espresso coffee maker. I could go make myself an espresso right now. What has that got to do with uh, putting the dog out because the dog has to go to the bathroom? It's zero. Yeah. And, and the truth is, if you can see those as separate, most people don't. They do. They see the world as a, 
a mass of sights, sounds, and events, a swirling mass of sights, sounds, and events, and they can't get a grip on it. No. The way you get a grip on it is one system at a time. Yeah. You know, and you take the, the worst dysfunctional one and fix that one first, then the next dysfunctional one and fix that one next and yeah. on and on. And then you get to a place where all you do all day long is work on systems. Honest to God, that's what you do. And, and you have other people doing the work. We have a well, I'm writing another book uh, that's separate. I have a, we have a little property development company. We have, I think, eight houses or something like that. And Diana totally get, has the system. My wife has a systems mindset. We're hiring people to do all the work and showing them how to do it to free us up to do other things. And and uh, it's it's you find yourself getting ahead and you're so convinced and it doesn't take long that this is the right way to look at your life that you'll never go back. You can never go back. Yeah. And you don't want to go back. <laughs> I think I say that in this fourth edition. You yeah. can't go back in any way you don't want to go back because right. it's so effective. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense for sure. Well, Sam, we're I know we're about at the time that we had said we would use when we started. I probably have, if you're up for it, about another 30 minutes, 20, at least 20 minutes sure. of questions. Are you okay with that? Oh yeah. Sure. Okay. I love talking about this stuff. You can tell, right? <laughs> yes. And yeah, you've clearly given a lot of thought and done a lot of work. So, okay. I want to go ahead and transition us to the enlightening lightning round. So it's a series of questions on a variety of topics. Uh, my aim for the most part is to ask the question and kind of stand aside. I might tug on a few of your answers here and there, but okay. otherwise I'll just keep us moving through it. Okay. Brilliant. Good. Okay. Question number one. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a. Can I rephrase the question a little bit? Sure. Life is a collection of processes that you either control or you don't control. But your life is a collection of processes. And the box of chocolates for a scum thing is very interesting and it's very true. But it suggests randomness. And yeah. surpri well, surprises are great. Uh, it suggests you don't know what you're going to get next. And my message to our listeners, viewers, is that you can, you can make what you want happen if you pay attention to the separate processes and get a hold of the ones that will get you there. So it's, it's not as random as, as what Forrest Gump kind yes. of sort of suggests, right? Yeah, or it doesn't have to be, <laughs> yeah. for sure. For yeah. sure. Okay, thank you. Question number two. What's something about which you have changed your mind in recent years? You know, we all want to get along with people, right? Mm. And uh, every phase of life, and you can to put it in decades, how you were when you were 20 to 30 is different from how you were from 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50, 60. Okay. Yeah. So in my sixth decade, I'm 72 now. I'll be 73 in October. Somewhere in my sixth decade, toward the end of the sixth decade, I learned to say no. Mm. I really learned to people. I really, really, although I prophesized this before, I, I really started to get almost a little constructive, cynical attitude about certain business deals, people, even family members that I need to limit. Okay. Mm. And I, you know, older guys are often accused of, of being cranky old men. Right. Well, there's a reason for that. And so what happens is there's a certain amount of BS in life. You're much younger than me. Brilliant. And, and so everybody in my office is 30 in their thirties, uh, except for a couple that are one's 50 and one's early forties, two or early forties. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a whole lot in a lifetime uh, that happens. And you, I think a person has a certain reservoir of putting up with a certain amount and a limited amount of BS. Mm -hmm. Okay. And been down certain roads so many times you don't want to repeat that again. And I think this has to do with just getting older and maybe, maybe a propensity for crankiness. 
as you get in your 60s and your 70s. And you could say, well, I don't feel useful anymore and all this. No, that's not my life. But I, what I've learned to do, and it's in full keeping with the systems mindset, this is a very good question. Thank you for challenging me. Uh, I'm less and less uh, emotional about relationships and more mechanical about them. I'm very mm-hmm. deliberate about the relationships I have. Mm-hmm. I have a half a dozen of really good friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, one, five of them are guys. And one of them is a lady who works for me. But I have a certain limited number of friends where I used to have a ton of what I would call friends. Mm-hmm. And now they're just acquaintances. And I, I am not doing Facebook anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing the social media, you know, kind of, mm-hmm which gets into the virtue signaling thing. So one of the things I don't do anymore is uh, as time gets shorter, let's face it, uh, is not waste time on bad relationships or bad deals in with another organization, maybe, or any bad stuff. I jettison it quickly. So that mantra of automate, delegate, delete, I I'm a real pro at deleting now in relationships. I just had a, this morning, I just, I just ended a relationship with a new company that was going to do a video for us. And it was too much BS. And I, there were years before me where I would have, well, let's try to work it out. But when you spend hours and hours and hours, just trying to put the deal together, it's not going to work out in the long run. I've learned that. And my guy, my IT chief engineer in Italy was trying to make a deal with some marketing people for us Mm -hmm. over there. And uh, they couldn't put the deal. They couldn't put the deal together. And he, he, used a, he used a great phrase to suggest what he told the guy finally and hung up the phone. And uh, he's, he's learned from me, don't spend, I wish I had done this sooner, don't spend a lot of time on relationships that all the indicators are, the red flags for improvement at the beginning are, it's not going to go well because there's a lot of people out there you should be spending your time trying to make a good deal with. And when you find those people, hang on to them for dear life. They're, they're, they're out there, but when you find them, make them close, do what you need to do to keep them close friends or compatriots in a business or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And I, I do relate this to my age. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? <laughs> Why couldn't you give me these questions in advance? <laughs> uh, okay. I got to pull this out of the 60s. Okay. Um, and it's not we are all one. It's that in some way, I would want to say, now is the only moment you have. Mm. Now is the only moment you have. And let me, let me, so I've been listening to Jordan Peterson's second book. He was on drugs for the second book and it were drugs because he was having some real physical problems, not that kind of drug, you know, uh-huh. and some of it gets kind of off into the, but in chapter four, He talks about your community of future lives, Hmm. your community. You have a community of of yourself Mm -hmm. this second, the next second, the next second. What are you doing in this moment to satisfy the community of yourself that stretches out into infinity or to the day you die, obviously? Uh, And that's why uh, when we put procedures together, We want to, uh, it's in the moment, it's in the now, but it is to make the future better. Yeah. Okay. So I would do that now statement. Uh, Now is all we've got in some, some way, paraphrase it, whatever, but somehow that is the only moment we have. The past is history. It's Mm -hmm. gone. No bringing it back. And the future is conjecture. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah. But what you can do right in this moment is to start those processes that are moving into the future to move in the way you want them to move. And you can channel them and you can steer them and you'll end up with more money than you need and more time than you need. And, and you will really contribute to the people around you, which of course, and I know you feel this way, uh, uh, brilliant because we have talked about this. You explained this to me about how satisfying it is to take your life 
and help repair other people's lives. And this isn't virtue signaling. This is actually a truth to make yourself happy from a, let's say from a mechanical uh, mercenary standpoint, if you want to be happy, you have to create value for others. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We all want our lives to matter. We all want to be of service. And yeah. I think we truly are happiest when we're helping others be happy without compromising ourselves. No, yeah. don't compromise your principles ever, yeah. ever, 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 because your future selves won't pre appreciate that. They'll look back and they'll see that. Yeah. You've got to take care of yourself right now and plan for those future selves out there. The communities, uh, the future community of yourself. I just love that. I heard that this morning. I was mm -hmm. walking the dogs uh, down in the canyons this morning in chapter four in his second book. And he was talking about that. And I want, I want to play that part again, because it was such a great concept. What about your future selves? Brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> you know, brilliant, what yeah. about, what about the future brilliance? Yeah. Uh, and whatever, time period you want to slice it right yeah. and so i had i had really not thought of it in, in terms of that analogy and again jordan peterson is the analogy king of the world as far as i can yeah. tell yeah. yeah awesome well question number four is what book other than one of your own have you gifted or recommended most often you know i look i look uh back at tony robbins with fondness and mm -hmm. and and i i am the fond of so much now but he wrote a book called unlimited power back in the 90s i think one of his yeah. first books he's just a young guy when i started following him i think he was 27 he lived in venice california uh before jim morrison ever came along i think <laughs> but i don't know maybe not but uh i think that unlimited power is great um how i, I found, found freedom, freedom in an, in an unfree, unfree world, world harry brown, right. harry brown. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that book. Oh my God. This is mandatory reading. Wow. Brilliant. <laughs> Write it down. Wow. <laughs> how did you, how did this book come into your life? I don't know. Uh, it was kind of a, I don't remember, honestly, but I've got about six copies, uh, all first editions. And then I've got Jordan Peterson's books up here that I just give them away. Mm. Um, Jordan Peterson's first book, The 12 Rules. Have you read that? I have not read it. I'm familiar with it. The audio is great. Uh, I usually, I, I like the tangibility of a book, as you can yeah. imagine. Uh, yeah. I love to sit down. It's comforting. My library is downstairs in the basement, and I'll sit down there with the dogs, and there's something about reading from a book. Yeah. Yes, Work the System is available in audio and Kindle and everything else, but I... Uh, I did uh, work the system in hardcover. Uh, uh, kind of the opposite of the way most books are. Most books come out in hardcover and they're followed up with softcover. My first self-published books, and I talk about it in the, in the mm -hmm. preface, mm -hmm. uh, I started with the softcover and went to a hardcover because of this tangibility thing. There's something about it. I don't know what it is, yeah. but I don't do Kindle or e-readers at all. Yeah. Uh, so Jordan Peterson, Harry Brown, uh, Tony Robbins. Oh, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits, of oh, yeah. <laughs> mandatory Classic. reading. And Absolutely. then uh, I used to be a Dale Carnegie uh, host and oh, wow. uh, Dale Carnegie's uh, winning friends and influencing people. Mandatory reading. Yeah. Um, but there's a there's a few books for you. Right on. Thank you. So in your life, you traveled a ton. What's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? I try to take no more than two sets of clothes. Okay. Mm. Uh, sometimes one pair of jeans, and I'm talking about to Asia wow. or Europe or whatever. Unless I'm, go I don't really go to any dress up fest fests anymore. Wow. But uh, I really try to take a very basic set in a carry on, and I do not check my luggage. If you're so going through Heathrow. Do not check your luggage. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do not. Uh, so uh, my travel hack uh, after carting so much around the world is to go minimalist and I'll buy what I need when I get there. Yeah. yeah. Smart. Smart. Yeah. Question number six is what's something you started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Oh, uh, oddly enough, I'll give you a couple of examples of each. 
Um, so I stopped running when I was 32 because I was destroying my back. Uh, and I was a big runner back then. They, we had the Diet Pepsi 10Ks everywhere and every, all my friends were running. And and uh, and my nurse friend, a male nurse friend of mine, <laughs> we went to visit him in Colorado. And uh, I told him, you know, I'm having trouble. You know, maybe you can help me. Sometimes I get out of bed and I can hardly walk to the bathroom. Wow. But I'm in really good aerobic condition. He says, yeah, 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 I've seen a lot of guys like you, Sam. You're an aerobic. You're going to be an aerobic miracle, and you are now an aerobic miracle, but you're going to be an orthopedic nightmare. Wow. And I stopped running and started riding and climbing. And right now what I do, you know, one of the greatest exercises there there is, uh, brilliant, is I have a 30-pound pack that I carry when I take the dogs out. Oh, yeah. Because I can't get my heart rate up going uphill unless I have a 30 pound pack on. Yeah. yeah like and, rocking. Uh, that is the best exercise upstairs, downstairs, everywhere. Wow. Uh, that's something I started doing when I came to Kentucky because you can't get more than 500 vertical feet where I live. And it's mm. always climbing down into a canyon. And back in Oregon, I could climb North Sister and get 3,000 vertical feet, no problem. Yeah. Uh, but that's not the way it is here. So there's something I started. Uh, the other thing is I don't drink anymore. I quit mm. when I was 30. It was killing me. Mm. It's poison. And yeah. I, I don't want to sound like a prohibitionist or anything. I don't care if people drink. Uh, but alcohol, I was allergic to alcohol, literally, not just wow. the standard hangover, but I was allergic to alcohol. And I quit doing that. And here's a here's a good hack. Uh, it's melox, uh, meloxicam. Hmm. Meloxicam, if, you're, if you have aches and pains, uh -huh. your elbows, your legs, your back, meloxicam, 15 grams of meloxicam a day, they all go away. Wow. They all go away, and there's no side effects. It's an anti-inflammatory. Boy, if our listeners, some of our listeners out there don't get anything out, else out of this, get your doctor to give you a prescription for meloxicam and then report back to me and let me know how it goes because wow. it will be pretty cool. You'll, you'll see that uh, that stuff really does a trick. It's the only, it's the only drug or I take, but I, I mm. think the thing I've done all my life and I started when I was 11 was aerobic exercise and Diana, my wife is the same way. Yeah. Uh, I think aerobic exercise keeps you young, stops the bad stuff from happening. It's the best thing you can do. Uh, and again, you know, we could go into this whole systems mindset thing about that. And yeah. I talk about in the book, I talk about uh, blood tests, getting blood tests and making sure your blood chemistry is right. That's where you have to go back. I had to teach my doctor this. Hmm. He said, you don't need blood tests. I said, yeah, I do need blood tests. He says, no, you're just, uh, what did he say? Uh, you're overstressed. This, hmm. All your problems are stressed. Yeah, I'm working 100 freaking hours a week, doc. Yeah. Do the blood test. Well, you don't need to. I really, I got an argument with a guy. I said, if you won't do it, I'll get some other doctor to do it. And I had he, Steve had been my doctor for 10 years. Wow. He's still my doctor now, 40 years. Wow. Uh, so 30 years. So uh, do blood tests. That was the biggest thing I had because it told me this was low, this was low, this was low, this was high. And mm -hmm. then you adjust. If you get your chemistry, because aren't we just chemicals? If yeah. you break us down, aren't we chemicals? If your chemicals aren't right, how can you be okay? And yeah. it wasn't, there was stress related, but it was creating more stress all the time. And don't exercise too much. I've, I've learned that. Don't exercise. Don't pound yourself into the ground. I used to do that in my 40s, thinking I was helping. Yeah, uh, you no, can do it. No, yeah. don't do it. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, question number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? I wish they knew the founding documents. And how our country was founded. Yeah. You know, um, I wish they knew because, you know, I didn't write this book out of a sense of patriotism. I'm, I'm conservative and I believe in uh, self-responsibility mm -hmm. uh, and, and covering your own basis. And I know you're not going to get anywhere in life if you're reading some kind of a menu, left or right. And that's all you believe. You've yeah. got to make up your own mind. But I, I wish people had a better sense of the history of this country uh, and how it was formed and why it was formed. And it had to do with individual liberty. It yeah. had to do with uh, the individual's uh, ability to make choices and so forth. That's what I wish with a passion 
Uh, and we don't, we're not doing that anymore. And we don't want to get into politics. I get I get that. But uh, that's what uh, that's what I wish for is mm-hmm. that we had our kids were better educated in the founding and the documents and what was tried to be done. Yeah, I know it wasn't perfect. I get that. But basically, it was it's worked pretty well. Right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. It's it's um, stood the test of time pretty well over the last couple of centuries, for sure. Yeah. OK, question number eight. What is the most important or useful thing you've learned about making relationships work? Well, of course, listening. Right. And so, well, we're in this podcast and you're asking me to talk. So I'm kind of but my conversations aren't like this with people. I I really try to shut up and listen, 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 listen. And uh, be aware of when you're not in a good frame of mind, because you might say something that will destroy a relationship. And sometimes that's all you need to know in the heat of the battle. If you're having a political discussion or some kind of a discussion, don't say that thing you really, really want to say that will destroy that relationship. Don't make what I call the big mistake. And you can do it with business. You can make the big mistake. You know, um, you put, you're, in a, you're sort of in a card game and you put the farm up, yeah. <laughs> right? You don't, want to, you don't want to put the farm up uh, in, a, in a relationship that's gone on for years and years and years. And by golly, if, if you do screw up, you've got to go back and apologize. Mm-hmm. I've got people in my family that don't know how to apologize. I've got friends who don't know how to apologize and they're not friends anymore. I mean, they're not enemies, but if you can't say, I'm sorry, real fast after you screw up, you're going to lose your friends yeah. and your family. Yeah. Yeah. It can happen for sure. Question number nine is about money. What's um, aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money? Get debt free. I mean, all of it on uh, uh, Andy back in Centratel and my, my CEO, everybody understands that the company is completely debt free. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Diana and me were debt free. Uh, she has a really nice car. It's a brand new, uh, well, it's 21 um, Audi RS Q8. And if there's any car people out there, they're going to ask, how did you get that? <laughs> Five, 600 horsepower uh, V8 turbo. It's her car. Wow. It's really expensive and it's debt free. Okay. And my Ford pick, my 150 is a uh, uh, pickup is, is debt free, debt free, brilliant. It does something to your head. Yeah. And Dave Ramsey is a guy, the go-to guy for that. Okay. Dave yeah. Ramsey is get, you have to get debt free to, before you can get to these other places. And it has more to do. It doesn't, it has a lot to do with interest you pay when you own, or you, when you owe on your house or your car, it has everything to do with that, of course, but it's something that happens in your head when you don't owe anybody, anything, all yeah. you do is pay your taxes every year and, and uh, you know, your utilities every month. Uh, that's that's my recommendation. And you can go back to the systems mindset. And, you know, the epigraph in my book is Occam's Law. And we all by now know what Occam's Law is. The simplest explanation is usually the correct explanation. Well, the simplest thing to do with your life is not to owe people money. Right. Oh, it's such a, and I, I wasn't in that, I haven't been in that place all my life. But that was an important breakthrough. And I didn't realize what an important breakthrough it was until I paid off the last, uh, I think it was a mortgage that I owed some time ago. And uh, if something comes over you about being debt free, it's a, yeah. it's a sense of release. Yeah. Good. Good for you. That's, that's awesome. And I suspect there are people listening that, that this is exactly what they need to hear right now. Yeah. So Dave, Dave Ramsey.com. I think that's what it is. I yeah. didn't go through any of his courses or anything, but I love the guy. I occasionally yeah. listen to him. He's fun to listen to. On yeah. Radio. He is fun to listen to. And I think he's got a lot of really practical wisdom for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, okay. Speaking of money, something I've done to attempt to express my gratitude to you for sharing so generously of your time and your wisdom is uh, I've done two things. One is I have gone on Kiva.org the micro lending website. And I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to an entrepreneur, a woman named Ma, Ma Buba in Tajikistan. And uh-huh. she will use this money to buy bags that she will sell and thereby improve the quality of life for her customers and herself and her family. 
So that's the first thing. And the other is, thank um, you. That's very yes, nice. It's is, is my pleasure. And I also went to, I believe it's cashmerefamily.com. Yeah. So your charity, and I made a hundred dollar donation oh, to thank you, what you're doing with cashmere oh, family aid. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. I, uh, we're helping, uh, we help schools over there and, and, uh, I've adopted a family and the two girls, <laughs> Uh, the thing over there in Pakistan is odd Kashmir is the girls are usually married off quite young and many times to their first cousin. And it's a, it's an appointed marriage. It's a prearranged marriage. Uh, but these two girls are uh, 20 and 21 years old are going to medical school and they haven't their father Kizer, who I've worked with over there since 2006 uh, has done everything in his life to, to make it possible for these girls to go to medical school. They're going to be doctors. And so Diana and I help them through. Uh, that, 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 and so feel pretty good about that. That's awesome. But anyway, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. That that money will go to good use, 100% of it. But I'm not going to take $90 of it <laughs> and buy no. gas with a car. Uh, no, 100% no. of it will go to to the girls. That's Thank awesome. You. And I, and I, I realized I misspoke that, um, for, and for anyone who wants to learn more, or maybe also participate in the work you're doing there. It's, it's not cashmerefamily.com. It's dot org. Cashmerefamily. Yeah, Cashmerefamily.org. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. And another thing, um, brilliant. Uh, I've talked about hands-on help mm-hmm. and, uh, Josh Fonger runs a company called WTS enterprises.com work, the system WTS. And you can use that to find him or go through the website, my website, workthesystem.com, and you'll find Josh. I have nothing to sell. I don't need the money, honestly. Yeah. And uh, uh, I just want Josh to continue to be successful. He's been so loyal and so good, and he gets it so well. And he's 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 a one-on-one consulted with over a 1,000 businesses, and he's never had a failure. Wow. That's One a- guy died. <laughs> you know. Wow. And I think there was another guy that had a family situation or something, but the systems mindset, the whole work, the system method methodology does work. And I just do it for the, I do it for the fun of it. You're not paying me for this. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I, I mean, maybe some, maybe I'll sell a few books, but that doesn't matter to me that much financially or anything. Yeah. Well, I, I hope so. I know that what you're doing is uh, improving lives. It certainly has the potential to, for many people who are feeling I don't want to say trapped, but less than satisfied with the business they've started to achieve freedom. <laughs> it's this paradox of entrepreneurship. Very often we start. It is a paradox. Like, yeah. I mean, you're yeah. so caught up with trying to survive. How are you going to help anybody else? So you got to get past yeah. that point. And yeah. then there's so much satisfaction. Uh, the the nonprofit, the people we help, we just, we just gave $6,000 to the local library down here. And, you know, we're, we've, we can, we can do things that give us so much satisfaction. And Diana and I, uh, I keep looking back that way. Uh, in the other room, as the sun came up, we always, uh, this morning, as we always do, we had two espressos. And wow. we were talking about that. And we were talking about this other family just down around the block here whose kid is going to Spain because uh, he got a special scholarship wow. invitation. And we're going to help him a little bit. And cool. uh, there's no more greater satisfaction. And you know that, brilliant. Because this is what you do. Uh, there's no more greatest satisfaction, and this is not virtue signaling. There's yeah. no more greatest satisfaction than helping somebody else get ahead, as yeah. long as they're. And like Diana says, you don't want to work harder than your client. Right. As long as long as they're showing determination and they're really serious about it, uh, help them out. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Well, the the last part of this, if if you're good for just a few more questions. Sure, I'd love to ask you about writing and creativity, knowing yeah. that uh, many people who are listening, this is something that they also want to do. They want to take their ideas, their experiences, put them between the covers of a book, send them out into the world in a way that makes a difference for others. So um, a few, just a few questions I have. One is, I understand your dad was an English teacher and your mom was an author. Yeah. Right. So it seems almost inevitable. Of course, you're going to write <laughs> some books of your own. But what did you learn from parents who were these writers themselves or teachers themselves? Okay. What did you learn? My dad, I remember driving along in the car. You'd love my dad. Everybody loved my dad. And he died almost 10 years ago. And my mother died 10 years ago on July 2nd wow. of this year. So they died close together. They weren't married anymore. Uh, but they just 
they were in Bend, Oregon. I was the caretaker for both of them. So my dad, I'd be driving along in the car and I'd say something with bad English. <laughs> and then he'd say, Sam, that's not the way you say it. You say it like this. And he'd tell me, and I say, oh, dad, you know what I mean. And he said, he said, that is not going to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get anywhere in life, you have to convince people you're intelligent and mm -hmm. you can offer them something. And if you talk like that, and I was 14 or something like that. And then my mother said, and uh, I don't know, it's the, it's a dedication in one of the books. Uh, she said, Sam, because I said, I want to write a book like you, Ma. And she says, Sam, don't write fiction. <laughs> she said, don't do fiction. There's too much competition out there. Mm. She said, don't write a book, meaning nonfiction. Don't write a book unless you have something meaningful to say, unless you're going to be able to help people with it. Mm -hmm. And I held off till I was in my 50s. And I, that always rung true with me from Ma. Uh, and they were very opposite personalities, but those are two of the greatest things I think I took away from those relationships. Wow. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm an author because of my mother. I guess, I guess I was inspired. And in the English language um, can be butchered. And uh, I drive Diana crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I drive her crazy. Uh, but uh, it's an art and it's a skill and uh it's fun. But, you know, my guy in Italy, my guy in Romania, they speak five languages each. I speak one yeah. dumb American, <laughs> one language. I had took French in high school and I can decipher it and I can kind of read, get the gist of it. But uh, I uh, have so much um, appreciation for people in Europe who can mm. speak multiple languages. And I've spent a lot of time over there and I'm always flabbergasted. Don't try to ever learn the Hungarian language, brilliant. You never will. <laughs> no, I don't know that there's, I'd have a lot of opportunity to use it anyway. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with your advice on that one. <laughs> but um, what's your, so I do want to just call out something you just mentioned there is that you didn't write your first book until you were in your fifties. That's correct. You were 50, right? Yeah. And that's, that's pretty awesome to me because I know this is a dream that many people harbor for a long time, you know, and even when you get a little older, it's not something that you have to abandon by any means. You can, you can do it and it can turn out great. You can share it widely and make a difference for people. One thing I am curious about is how, especially knowing that you were um, a business owner and you did have other, you know, as an adult, other responsibilities, other obligations, other opportunities, or even distractions. What, what is your process for actually getting a book written? How do you go about it? How do you organize your time? What habits and routines do you have? What tools do you use? Anything along the lines of how do you do it as a practical matter? Let me tell you the mechanical part, but don't let me forget to talk about my publisher, okay? Sure. So uh, the mechanical part is always start with an outline. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. I just sat down and started writing. I'd go from this to that to this to that. I remember one day the whole living room was covered with pages. Mm -hmm. uh, printouts and I couldn't put them together. I kind of sort of had to start over again. Mm -hmm. You really need to start with an outline. Well, sort of like a strategic objective, I guess. Uh -huh. I think about it. Uh, you may, you should spend months on it to put the, to put the chapter titles together, uh -huh. put the chapter titles together very, very carefully and then work through it mechanically and don't deviate. If you get into it and you feel you need to deviate, yeah, you can create another chapter. But the chapters should be separate from each other. You've got to pick the chapter titles so they don't run into each other. They've got to be separate, but they've got to lead into each other, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. events happen over time, one, two, three, four, five. So your book has to have a start. It has to end. The front matter of your book is very important. Uh, the preface, uh, so I've got two prefaces in mind, preface to the fourth edition, which I wrote not too long ago, preface to the first edition, the introduction. And I had, uh, there's, a, there's a forward in there too. Uh, but be very, very careful how you start the book and know for sure where you're going. I wouldn't start a book without knowing where I was headed. 
again, I'm not a fiction writer and some fiction writers operate that way. Uh, and I, I guess that works, but if you're going to write a, if you're going to write this kind of a book for nonfiction, you really, you really need to decide if you have something to say and, and how you're going to get to point B from point A starting. Now, as far as mechanical, uh, my writing starts at three or four in the morning until I give out uh, or I get interrupted. But boy, those, those hours before dawn, nobody's going to bother you. If I can get two or three hours of solid writing in a day, it doesn't take long to write a book. And a book's 60,000 words, 80,000 words. Uh, I'm going to do some KDP uh, short. Some of these chapters need a, a little book of their own, and, and I'm going to write some 6,000-word online-only books uh, starting pretty soon. But I can write a, a thousand to two thousand words in a sitting and i'll be going through it again uh i'll be going through it again a lot um before the actual published date you go th i go through my books over and over and over again um and i think that's it that's me I, i'm a morning person some people will want to write at night it just depends. And I talk about that in the book about your, your uh, cycles. What is your physical cycle? Are you a morning person or a night person? I talk about that in there too. Yeah. That's so important for every one of us to learn, right? Cause you talk in the book about biological prime time, about mechanical prime time, these ideas that if people aren't familiar with that, uh, you know, if they pick up the book and read that they can apply that to virtually any, yeah. anything they're committed to as an ongoing process in their life. For sure. But tell me, so you asked can, me to remind you about me, the publisher. Let me, let me hold you up. I, got, I, I do have some good advice along these lines. Okay. There's a couple of books that I call, I would use this term, mandatory reading. Uh -huh. uh, so John Steinbeck wrote a book as he was writing The Grapes of Wrath, which you may or may not know was written in 100 days in the early 30s. I he had 100 days that. to get it done for his publisher. Wow. And it's called Working Days, and it's the story of him writing his book. Wow. It's the most fascinating thing you've ever seen. And in there is a, a, a graphic, not a graphic, a, a photo of one of his pages. And he had these super long pages, uh -huh. narrow and long. And that man would write. And in this particular page, they showed there was one correction in an adjective uh, that he made. He wrote it all longhand. Wow. I'm amazed. I mean, the guy's. The guy was uh, an alien of alien intelligence. I, could, I can't write that way. And your people that are going to write a book will either be able to do that and probably not need to go through their scripts over and over and over again. Another yeah. great book is Stephen King's book uh, on writing. Oh, yes. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, both fictional writers. I get it. Uh, but have you read that? Brilliant. I have. I, I really yeah. love that book so much. Yeah. It's so practical about writing, whether it is fiction or nonfiction. He puts uh, he puts heavy metal on in the background. Boom, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, he's writing. I just yeah. cracks me up. Everybody's different. A very, very different. Yeah. Uh, I can't I can't operate that way. I can't even yeah. have soft music in the background. I need silence. But that's mm. me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yep, that's right. And so much I think of the challenge or and sometimes the joy of writing is figuring out yeah. what works for us by yeah. learning what doesn't work. But <laughs> tell me about, tell me about your publisher and tell me um, this is probably be part of the discussion, but tell me also about your rights, how you've held on to or, or thought about oh, the yeah. work. Yeah. And, and I did have a lawsuit. A guy plagiarized my book. His name's Rick Sheffron. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, he, uh, the reason I nailed him, uh, was because I had enough. My, I. It's a long story. Uh, you got to copyright your book. Just writing a book will protect you to some degree, but you got to go through the crop. And I went through the trademark procedure too, and it's a nightmare. You got to find an attorney to do it and everything. And uh, you need to go through that and protect your work because he took my book and he plagiarized it. Wow. So. But beyond that, maybe you want to bleep his name out. <laughs> the guy is so annoyed. But uh, this book is uh, publisher is called Greenleaf Publishing. And what their legitimate publisher, it's not self-published. It's a mm -hmm. legitimate publisher. Mm -hmm. But I was allowed 
with the way they do things to keep ownership of my manuscript. Mm-hmm. Okay. Normally the way it works is somebody writes a new book. If they can find a publisher who will even look at it, uh, which is doubtful. There's a thousand books published every day in the United States. Um, Greenleaf, the way they operate is they allow the author to keep ownership of the manuscript. If you do find a regular publisher, 99% of publishers, they will buy your manuscript from you and you're done. You get your 30,000. If you sell X number of books, you get $2 a book or whatever the deal is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you can't go back and revise it, right? Remember I said, this book has four editions. That's because I own the manuscript. Okay, I had to pay for the printing, the editing, some of the marketing, I didn't do much marketing. This book has not been marketed correctly, uh, but I have a kind of a cult-like following of it, uh, which is good enough for me. But I've retained ownership and I decided in 2019, I wanted to do another edition. And so I did. If your publisher owns your manuscript, they'll laugh at you if they'll even take your phone call. Mm. So I recommend, now then there's the dustbin of the self-published. Uh, you're just you're just, just throwing in with everybody else out, and everybody else's uncle and everybody else's cousin that wanted to write a book. And the no. book's typically about their life story, and nobody cares, man. Nobody cares. They've got their own lives to live. I really uh, caution people, even though they've had an interesting life, unless you're way, way up in the political, the top 10 political people that we know, left mm-hmm. or right, uh, you're not going to sell any books. Because you don't have no marketing scheme and the publisher will do that. And uh, so there's a fine uh, line here to decide what you're going to do with your future self. Mm -hmm. And what I knew back in 2008 was that I would want to embellish this book to make it better. And I talk about it in the preface. I talk about uh, all the iterations of the book that went through Mm -hmm. Uh, the horrible the horrible mistakes I made in my self-publishing and then getting a publisher and the problems we had with the publisher and everything. But I've been with Greenleaf now uh, since 2008 and they specialize in authors who want to revise their book. If it's, if it's a non-fictional thing and there's truth 10 years from now, as well as truth. Now you want to retain ownership of your manuscript and don't fall into the trap most most authors fall into. You'll have to cough up some big dollars to do that, but it's worth it. It's one of the best things I ever did. Greenleaf, uh, greenleafbookgroup.com. Awesome. Great, great advice for those who are committed to this and not just wanting to publish a vanity project or something. Well, you know, and, and, and people who just want to write a story about their lives and they get satisfaction out of it. Good. Go do that. Yeah. But good luck even getting your family to read it. It's just right. people don't read anymore, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. that people just don't read. This is a guideline for saving your business. So some people read it, actually yeah. read it. There yeah. is a way to get uh, a condensed version, a summary version uh, through the website, but People need to sit down, take a deep breath. And by the way, reading a book is the best thing you can do to to, uh, increase your attention span because that's what's happened to us in 2022. By now, uh, people don't read. They don't sit down and focus for an hour on one thing, line by line by line. It's all sound bites. It's these damn phones uh, (laughs) and it's TV. And uh, reading, here's another author, Nicholas Carr. Mm. Nicholas Carr. He wrote two books, and the one that knocked me flat, and this was about 2008, I think. It was, it was pretty far back. Uh, it's called um, The Shallows. The Shallows. And he wrote another book after that called The Glass Cage. And it has everything to do with what's happening to our brains. And the beautiful thing of this is, so you think, okay, 20 years of cell phones, uh, I have no attention span. My wife said something to me five seconds ago, and I can't remember what she said, or so-and-so told me something on the phone, and I can't even remember what the subject was. This is a, this is a problem. I have a 2 I fight it all the time uh, of a low attention span. Take a deep breath. 
read a book and it will lengthen your uh, it will lengthen your attention span. And the great thing is when let's say you haven't read a book, some uh, one of our viewers out there, our listeners uh, hasn't read a book in a long, long time or they read the typical one book per year for some reason, or two, mm-hmm. two books. I read a couple of hardbacks a week at the rate I'm going now. I'm going through all of Louis L'Amour's stuff. The That's great awesome. lessons in that. I bought a whole collection of his books. Uh, the cool thing is this. If you haven't read for a long time and you want to, and you believe what I'm saying, you read Nicholas Carr, for example, there's a book you have to read, uh, or you listen to his audio, whatever. Uh, it doesn't take long to stretch your attention span out, like just a matter of a few days. In fact, it's a real burden when you first start and you've knocked off for a while. I know because I did that when I was writing my own book. Mm-hmm. I knocked off reading and I, I, I just got stacks of books all over the place. But uh, it only takes a few days to lengthen that uh, attention span. Mm-hmm. And then you do it every day and it gets longer and longer and you get more calm and more relaxed in your decision making. You don't feel like you have to make a decision right every moment, point yeah. of sale, which is it's a certain degree of valuable thing in business. But you want to be able to think about things before you make the wrong decision. The yeah. wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but Nicholas Carr, uh, I'm a big fan of Nicholas Carr. Awesome. Well, thank you for those recommendations. Well, the, the final question I have is what advice or encouragement do you leave those listening with who are either in the middle of their own project, you know, they're somewhere in the, the belly of the snake, so to speak, uh, or it, again, it's a dream they've been holding on to for a long time, but they haven't actually got themselves into action writing and publishing their book. What, what advice or encouragement do you leave? Oh, I could say, way? just do it and <laughs> get over yourself. <laughs> Be courageous. I could, t- I could say all these things that they've heard a million times before. <laughs> Uh, my, my advice would be, uh, this is totally self-serving, I guess. If you could go a layer deeper in your life and write a strategic objective on a personal level about what you want to accomplish, you'll find your, your desire to write, write a book is way up there high. Mm. Okay. It's way up there with the family, with the health, with everything else. And, I encourage people to to use this technique I call clustering, okay? Because I I spent an hour and a half with a woman from California last week for the fun of it. She was having some problems. She's a, you know, she loved the book and all and worked with Josh. And she says, what should I do first? Well, I said, don't prioritize the important things in your life. What do you mean? Don't prioritize the things. Well, listen to me. Listen to me. What are the five most important things? Well, my health, my family. Uh, I want to do, I want to be financially independent. Uh, a couple other things. And I said, well, whatever they are, I don't really care what they are, but don't give a priority to any one of them. Mm-hmm. Because if you take one of them, okay, my kids are most important and you sell your soul for your kids, you won't be taking care of your health. You won't be writing your book. Yeah. I said, Here's what you could do. Uh, and I do a little bit of each one every day. Mm-hmm. Spend an hour writing the book. Spend your time with the kids. Spend your time with the husband or the husband with the wife, whatever. And uh, clustering means you have a number of things that are very important in your life and they're all important. And stop worrying about which one is more important than the other because they all work together to make you what you are. And if you're going to write a book, put that in that cluster and just write every day and start with your outline. Keep it simple. What are the topics you want to talk about? Longhand, you know, and it can be several sentences for each chapter. You'll hone it down later, but do, do the first two chapters or, You're going to have, maybe you're going to have 30 chapters, depending on what kind of book you've got. Write the last chapters first. Write the preface first. Write the afterword first. Whatever you want to do, but do something every single day. Uh, And there's an exercise in my book uh, about getting started on a strategic objective. And what I say in there, I could read it. I could dig it up and read it. But basically what I say and every, the end of every chapter has an illustration, what I call an illustration. And that illustration is what I want you to do now is put the book down, pick up a piece of paper, get a pen and put it in front of you and write. 
And it, even if it's a sentence, just, and you've started, now you've started because the big part is starting, right? Yep. The big part is getting going. Yep. And if you can take that initial, for instance, if somebody's watched all the way through this chat we've had, brilliant, uh, it's because they were excited about it and they'll leave this uh, conversation with a sense of excitement. Now is the time to sit down and write the, write the title of your book or write yeah. the epilogue, uh, epigraph or whatever you're going to do. Start the book now while your enthusiasm is high and then keep your enthusiasm up as you see the pages accumulate. And that will drive you. Just like having some successful working procedures will drive you to keep doing that over and over and over. You got to have some small success to start. And that's an easy one to get. And that's in the book too, about how to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, great. Well, Sam, thank you so much again for sharing so generously of your time, of your experience, of your wisdom. I've really appreciated the opportunity to learn about life through your experience. And uh, I've taken away a lot of things that I will incorporate into my own business and share with others. And I'm looking forward to sharing this interview as well. Again, my guest today, Sam Carpenter, author of Work the System, The Simple Mechanics of Making More and Working Less. You can find this at your local bookseller, any fine bookstore, of course, online. And you can learn more about Sam and his work at workthesystem.com. Again, thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.